um, a research project. Okay. I'm going to start that again for the benefit of the recording. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is an entire seminar hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. And normally I would be in Cape Town, uh, but this week I'm in Harare, Zimbabwe, visiting my family and doing a research project investigating the use of new technologies in healthcare at the University of Zimbabwe and at uh, a major public hospital here. So we are very pleased to have uh, Louis Chude Soke here with us as our guest this week. Um, and I'm particularly excited uh, to have Louis here because I, I first came across Louis's work a few years ago, thanks to a little pamphlet that was a reprint of an essay of his. Uh, it's this little, uh, little book called Dr. Satan's Echo Chamber, uh, and it's published by Chimarenga magazine in, in Cape Town. Um, thanks to Tone uh, for your work on Chimarenga. And uh, I was really uh, turned on by this. I'm, I'm very interested in dub and reggae. I've been you know, exposed to the music form since I, was a, since I was a kid in this part of the world. And uh, as an artist, I, I, I work with it as part of the, the material and the culture that I work with. And uh, Louis' uh, essay on, on dub music uh, was you know, very insightful and influential on the development of my project, Dubship One Black Star Liner. And just as one example, Louis produces this metaphor of the, uh, the Black Atlantic as an echo chamber between which um, influences um, and music echoes from coast to coast um, between Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States. So, Louis is joining us here today uh, in part due to his work with artificial intelligence recently taking in a, an, an creative, a creative uh, approach to artificial intelligence and working with the electronic music duo Mouse and Mars. So Louis Chude Sake is, is a writer and a scholar um, and he's at Boston University in the United States. Uh, he writes on race and technology and he does a range of creative and collaborative projects. Um, he's curating the Afrofuturism show at Carnegie Hall next year, um, and he has, you know, many publications and accolades to his name. So I won't go through them, but uh, just to mention, for example, he is the editor in chief of the Black Scholar, Scholar, one of the oldest and leading journals of Black Studies in the United States, and he's collaborated with many artists, performers, and programmers on projects focused on sound, music, race, and technology. So. We have an artificial intelligence strand of research at our institution. We are a pan-African research institution, which is approaching this in terms of uh, its social impact, the idea of ethics of care in medicine associated with artificial intelligence. And for my own research projects, uh, I'm working as an artist doing creative work with doctors and technologists um, and learning about their relationship to artificial intelligence and new technologies. So very excited to have Louis here. I'd suggested that we share a YouTube video quickly, which is like a three minute video that was one of the pieces of assigned material. For all of you out there, you've done your homework. Um, and I thought we would just show this uh, three minute clip just to ground everyone who might not be familiar with the project. And then from there, uh, Louis is going to speak. So let me, uh, let me do that. Yeah. With noise, engineering systems and masking them with noise, engineering systems and masking them with noise, engineering systems and masking them with noise. Can everyone hear okay? Is the sound coming through? Things that were not alive became alive and took their own destiny into their own hands. <laughs> working with sound and working with uh, Jan and Andy's incredible studio skills and Birds on Mars and this algorithm that learns and emerges through its own language in sound it just seemed a perfect way to bring the scholarly material into something that was really accessible. We create 
created a tool that is able to take your text input, feed it to the AI, and through the vector hacking that you modulate through changing parameters, it generates speech in unheard languages, non-existent dialects, various melodies, and other experimental features. And so when you encounter, when I encounter the, the voice, it's me asking a question about myself. We, uh, we must control the robot. We must control the program. Everybody involved in this project is the opposite. We want to create this thing so that it will have its own life. We want it to be anarchic and we want it to question us. It's a suggestion. This record is really a suggestion. Like maybe we can learn from machines that it's okay to be human by also not expecting so much from us as humans like who have to become so much better than what we already are. Life always announces itself to sound. Your life always announces itself to sound. Your life always announces itself to sound. But why should machines not have fun too? Yes, they yeah. are. Engineering systems and... Okay. So, uh, that was uh, that was a little intro to the project. Thank you, Louis. It would be great, uh, it'd be great to hear from you. Please, please go ahead. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Ralph, thank you for the invitation, and thank you, folks, for the interest in the work and the project. I greet all of you from somewhere in the middle of the United States on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, I'll start with some words about the project. Um, and hopefully we can have some conversation afterwards. History has taught us that humans can be made inhuman, transformed into animals or treated like objects. Laws and social practices have been enacted for specifically those purposes. Because technology has been implicated in that particular history, we as a sprawling crew of creative thinkers wanted to imagine and make possible the opposite. We wanted to craft a story in which inhuman objects could refine life, redefine life, and reimagine what it is to be human. To do this, we rejected the tired cliche of robot rebellion or machine takeover that has guided science fiction for much of its history. Stories of machines as slaves to human beings that go from compliant to resentful and rebellious, those kinds of stories inevitably return whenever there's a new technological development that manages to erase the memory of previous technological developments. And such stories generate even greater anxiety when a fear of the other is recast in technological terms. Instead, we decided to take seriously the fact that the more we learn about machines, the more we reveal about ourselves. We wanted to construct a narrative which acknowledges that the deeper we look into our technological futures, the more we recognize the tragic legacies of our inhumane pasts. Science fiction, after all, I've always argued, is a form of history. One thing it teaches us is that the very notion of humanity has required the constant invention of opposites, genders, nature, races, machines, have emerged from this particular history where Western colonialism differentiates itself as much by technological acumen as by skin and power. This technology has also enforced its particular view of the future as something inevitable. 
we wanted to reject that inevitability, that corporate driven inevitability. To do this, we decided to democratize the power to define life, to define consciousness, to define intelligence. Those terms would no longer be the sole property of human beings. Life could no longer be defined by the living. Intelligence could no longer be the sole possession of humans and consciousness, well, that would remain ineffable, difficult to define. We also suggested, hey, history would also be liberated from human beings. History after all is a competition of stories, a jostling of and struggle for meanings. A history told from the perspective of the emergent object could feature a different conception of life. It could be about how that object emerged, evolved, and how it imagined itself. It would celebrate its self-awareness and through sound, it would entice you to celebrate with it. Loosely put, that is the story of anarchic artificial intelligence. Well, that was the plan anyway, and the, or the theory behind the plan. Now for an object to tell its own story required that it begin with some degree of independence. Otherwise, it wouldn't be its own story. It would just be a tale of freedom ventriloquized by masters. In our case, that inhuman object was an algorithm created by a bespoke algorithm created by birds on Mars that moved quickly beyond imitation and into the sphere of self-learning. The algorithm then contributed to the story we all tried to tell by making it unstable, decentered, and that's why we called it anarchic. But about the team, we were many from a range of different cultural, social, and professional backgrounds. Some were given to the project's theoretical bent, while others to just make bangers in the studio. Some prefer the technical challenge of creating the bespoke algorithm, while others opted to focus on the repercussions of having to create something we couldn't control, but still had to trust. Among us, there were coders and engineers, musicians, a writer who tinkers in sound, that's me, and a few helpful eavesdroppers. And of course, there was also the algorithm whose development was measured as much in code as it was in sound. If you listen to the album, much of the album is in fact a narrative of that algorithm, algorithm learning to become itself, which it does at the end of the, of the album. The algorithm gave us all a focus especially once it began to gurgle and blither, babble, grunt, and cough. And then slowly but surely it began to speak. And the challenge for the band was to create the narrative of that, but also to use that as they created the rhythmic and the musical narrative. Well, that's why it is true to say that like all stories, anarchic artificial intelligence began with language, not just in terms of the algorithm, but in the way that all stories begin with words, lots of conversations. Now these initial conversations were largely about language. For example, one of the most important early moments while we were in the studio, important early moment of clarity, when someone asked, why do computerized speech programs or why do robots AI or Siri, right? Why do they always sound so cold, analytic, rational, right? Obviously that was both the stereotype as well as the political and economic fact of those who control the technology, which is to say that was precisely why machines sounded white, right? So we thought, well, if whiteness could be evoked by this hyper-technologized -technolog sound, what would a non-white AI sound like, right? And this is precisely at the moment when they were trying to use in the United States, you could swap out Siri's voice for Samuel Jackson. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but we were thinking about that as an interesting um, quasi stereotypical use of the black voice though, although I adore Samuel Jackson, <laughs> right? But what would a non-white AI sound like? In my mind, I'm also thinking of Nalo Hopkinson's um, Brown Girl, not Brown Girl in the Rain, her follow-up novel, uh, I can't remember the title right now. She's got a novel where there's an, a Caribbean nanny figure, a Jamaican AI system, right? That speaks in Caribbean vernaculars. That's in my mind as we're talking about this. 
what is that? It's not Brown Girl in the Ring. It's, uh, if anyone comes up with it, please let us know. I can't quite recall, but it's by Nalo Hopkins. And I haven't read it in a while or taught it in a while. Anyway, what would a non-white AI sound like? I thought about Nalo Hopkinson, right? I was thinking also about um, a neuromancer and the presence of Rastas and Rasta AI in the William Gibson novel. But that was the first challenge. If technological sound could be an analog for homogenous whiteness, we didn't want to do the same thing for a non-white vocal sound, right? Again, this was just at the moment when African-American actor Samuel Jackson had become a celebrated option for Alexa, not Siri, with the option for it to use profanity. Not sure how far that went. Our AI wouldn't be some vocoder or auto-tuned fantasy of ersatz fake soul in the machine, nor would it become some post-Quentin Tarantino quasi-stereotype of American blackness, which even though I adore Samuel Jackson, he can never escape. Even though we knew that the political desire to reject stereotyping could then lead us into an impossible quest for authenticity. The desire to always not be a stereotype can lead you endlessly searching for something authentic that you will never find. So the resolution to this challenge was not to seek the replication of language, since language is the fiction of pure speech. Language is instead an island surrounded by a sea of dialects, slang, and vernacular. What if the algorithm then trained on speech imperfections or dialect? What if it's centered on the flaws and imperfections of the human voice rather than attempted to perfect it? It could then home in on the differences between how language is supposed to sound and how it actually sounds in practice. What if the laws governing proper speech were dismissed as essentially the non-linguistic statements of power and dominance that they essentially are? then the algorithm would have to work through the ocean of vernaculars surrounding proper speech at any given moment, situation, or cultural context. It would understand that standard language is just a dialect with an arsenal. Language is an island surrounded by dialects, the politics of pure and proper speech, class, race, and studio banners. These elements pointed in one very clear direction for me, Jamaica and the Caribbean. In his classic piece, The History of the Voice from 1984, poet, critic, and Caribbean icon, the late Edward Kamar Brathwaite famously argued for the value of dialect, not only relative to actual speech, but as an ongoing creative response to cultural experiences and the landscape. Language in the Caribbean was inadequate, he suggested. It was, is colonial elite white and imported a relationship to sound and space that did not suit the location or the people. Dialect, on the other hand, was and is a form of resistance to white or native elite domination, but it was also a primary technique in expressing a self that was illegible to colonial power, a self that was either unheard by language or untranslatable. Again, this is Brathwaite. Much of Brathwaite's thinking about the creolizing of language was steeped in the anti-colonial nationalism of the 60s and 70s. It resisted Eurocentrism by asserting a response that was closer to Afrocentrism than to the work of another thinker that shaped our conversations at the beginning of AAI, someone who I've always been working with and I will continue to work with, though less so these days, I will return to his work, the Martinican thinker, Edward Glissant, who I'm grateful is now more present in conversations. Glissant's thinking was more congenial to this project because it resisted all centers. Despite the way people teach and use Glissant, Glissant's work is hostile to Eurocenters, Afrocenters, Indocenters, or any kind of centers. This clearly suited digital technology. For Glissant, Creolization is committed to a future that is so relentlessly blended that the obsession with centers can only replicate the hierarchies of race, law, and language. And if there are any of, our, any of you out there who know my book, The Sound of Culture, a lot of this should be familiar to you because this is the argument for the sound of culture that I decided to try to condense and import 
to the algorithm. But it was Brathwaite's thinking about sound that allowed our team to shape our conversations into a coherent project. Now for Brathwaite, music was not a product of a perfect codified language. It was an outgrowth of real speech in real time and in real place. A people's music, he argued, was essentially a map of their dialect. That was where specific rhythms, textures, noise effects, and expressions of style came from. His great example was Jamaican ska. What this suggested was that each new or transformed dialect enabled the genesis of a new music, and each new music signaled the birth of a new or transformed people. Glissant would call that process synthesis genesis, right? Which I think is something we should spend more time thinking about, right? For him, origins and blending are the same thing, <laughs> right? If the algorithm was trained on the relationships between dialects and languages and privileged the operation of dialect, could we establish rhythms and melodies that operated according to new rules? How would synthesis genesis work if we mashed Caribbean poetics and African diaspora theory together with artificial intelligence? The coders and engineers took to this challenge with the same speed and energy as the musicians. The algorithm would operate by way of what they called, what they developed something called vector hacking, in which it was trained to manipulate its own numerical inputs. Each of these inputs corresponded to specific sounds or variations in the voice being constructed, which was my voice, um, a version of, well, initially it was my voice, but then it took over. And then even though you hear on the album, Louis Chudasoki, it's actually the algorithm having lear learning to master Louis Chudasoki. By the end of the album, it's really not me, though it sounds just like me. It's just saying things I never said, <laughs> right? So initially the inputs were random, but eventually the algorithm was trained to perceive patterns that were invisible to us. It manipulated those inputs, creating sounds, pronunciations, and half words that were unpredictable yet programmatic, meaning that they could be codified and then redeployed in non-random ways. Eventually, the algorithm would find its way to standard language, as is heard towards the end of the album. But as I've shown above, that was the least interesting aspect of this project. The goal of the musicians and sound designers was to score that dialect as it evolved towards standard English. So the question that would haunt us was this. If by inventing a dialect, would we in effect be inventing birthing a being that was fluent in that dialect? Or one that knew how to dance to the music that that dialect would inspire? Or was that thinking just another fantasy produced by reading science fiction far too literary? Well, this is where another Caribbean thinker would give shape to our speculative fiction, which of course comes directly from The Sound of Culture, my book, and that's the Jamaican thinker, Sylvia Winter. In her work, there's a broad historical study of the categories of human or non-human. And that reminds us that work, that these categories are not biologically rooted. They are products of racial and colonial power and technology. My reading of Winter stretches, stresses how mutable those categories are, right? And it focuses on how that which was inhuman within one historical or cultural context could transition into the human in another one or it could simply claim or redefine that category for itself. In other words, people could be made into beasts or automata, which we know happen, and could also become people. Again, we don't have to search very far for historical examples of such transformation. It's the story of black people, right? Or in a long lineage of science fiction, machines could question and redefine the boundaries of the human, which is why in the sound of culture and the work I'm doing now, it's about the history of race as a history of technology. With these three Caribbean thinkers, Brathwaite, Glissant, and Winter, the narrative framework of anarchic artificial intelligence was complete. In fact, they brought us right back to, the where, to where this project began, history, technology, power, and prejudice, but also the ongoing project of freedom. And that's the story of anarchic artificial intelligence, put together by Mouse on Mars, 
Birds on Mars, the programmers, Dodo Ntishi, Rani Kedo, Derek Tingle, um, Yagmar Ukunchaya, who you see in the video, she's a member of Birds on Mars, me, and of course the algorithm. And this is not just being clever. At a certain point, you have to give credit to the algorithm for di dictating the shape of the songs and the narrative overall. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, that was great. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'll, I'll start with a few just responses myself and then move to uh, ask, uh, ask our, our participants to, to engage with you. I'm really, I mean, I'm really interested in my own research in this, in this reflection between machinic humans and human machines, which is part of what I hear. And uh, for example, grandmaster chess players who are machinic, machinic humans, you know, they often have special abilities yes. in terms of being able to visualize and, you know, do, and operate like a computer until they come up against the, you know, a very powerful computer, which uh, through brute brute force defeats, you know, defeats them. Um, and then we also have this desire to create human machines, you know, the simulations of, uh, of, of humans and machines and where those two things sort of reflect each other. And I think I heard Mouse on Mars talking a bit about that in the, in the video about humans and imperfections and what do we expect of machines. Um, I think it's interesting to think of how artists can embrace aspects of technology that are rejected by commercial interests. So for example, awesome. Yeah, artists like unpredictability. You know, you don't necessarily want to have a clear idea of what will emerge, and you're really interested to watch something and see what comes out of it. Um, and advances can be made in that way uh, as well. Um, and I guess there's a long, there's a longer genre of glitch music, which is mm -hmm. you know embracing the the broken byproducts of of some of some other process. Um, and I'm also just uh, I'm also thinking of the genesis of reggae as the the radio waves from Miami reaching Jamaica when the atmospheric conditions are right of uh, R&B music from the US that's getting listened to by people in Jamaica and uh, you know then it starts the seed of what becomes uh, of reggae but it seems to me like this collaboration between atmospheric forces um, mm. and culture and different strands of the diaspora meeting each other through when the conditions are right, meteorological and technological conditions enable this re-meeting of strands of the diaspora. So, I'm, 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 I'm interested. Let's say in in in, in finishing this, that uh, that when you've created this algorithm for anarchic artificial intelligence, you've created a generative system which mm. is a bit like a natural system. And I think that artists are also interested in that. Like gen generative art is um, in part trying to go. How can we give up control of, of what we've made and get something more interesting out of it? And it acts a bit like a natural process where you have lots of inputs that are out of your control. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. I would also add, and you know, one of the things that inspires my work on dub and reggae. I mean, well, everything in my work started with dub and reggae. <laughs> um, for someone to engage technology in an artificial intelligence um, coming from the black diaspora, right? Um, it's important to me that we make it possible to imagine people from the black diaspora. And I know we're, we're artists and so we had some programmers and my thinking about AI is mostly imaginative at this point, but it's just so crucial to understand that the history of black sound making has been a history of people using technologies that they weren't supposed to have access to. <laughs> right, um, yeah. it's a history of people using turntables or electronic instruments or building their own speakers or fetishizing machines. That history, which can be read as musical, should in fact be read as being about informatics. We have a history of informatics in the black diaspora mm -hmm. and it's coded through music. But if we understand that history, well then engaging artificial intelligence and so-called sophisticated cutting edge technology should be no different than anything else. And so one of the things I wanted this project to imagine was what if we got to a point where in the same way that kids in Harare or kids in Johannesburg or kids in Brooklyn or kids in London can download Pro Tools, Logic or Duos, imagine if they get to start messing with AI, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like really excited and scared, but why why can't we imagine it pro- yeah. the process operating in the very same way at some point? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and the, I mean, I think within what you're saying, there's also how uh, limitations on resources and also led to inventiveness around what was made with what's available. Oh, um, yes. And it's South Africa has an incredible uh, production into global dance, well, into dance music, electronic dance music, um, in which South African um, electronic musicians are using the same free PC software like Fruity exactly. Loops yeah. that's been used for decades, but somehow coaxing new sounds out of it. And you don't know how that's possible, but it, it really highlights the human aspect of the technology Absolutely. in that you can use the same thing, but get a very different result. And um, so... Why not imagine that this is not just the past, but also the future? Yes. In realms outside of music. Yeah, yeah. And we should take possession of artificial intelligence as well in terms of yes. our collaboration. Absolutely, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's open this to, to participants. If you would like to raise your little um, emoji hand um, or... Um, yeah, ind- indicate that, that you'd like to speak, turn on your video camera. Um, let me know if you have any questions or comments or any, any responses to, to Louis. Um, and also just to, there's Chris, Chris Ketz. Yeah, Chris, uh, Chris uh, was in contact with me earlier um, and, was, and was really looking forward to, to hearing your seminar. So Chris, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And if you can show yourself, um, if that's okay with you, then, then turn on your video as well. Hello. Hey, Chris. Yes. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I can't um, uh, switch on my video at the no moment. Worries. But in no the worries. spirit of AI and stuff, I'm I am here. <laughs> um, or so you say. Or so I say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to first say, like, um, you know, I am a huge uh, fan of of your work and um oh, thank you. you know i'm a bit nervous talking but you know um yeah i think the kind of echo of some of your texts has um specifically uh, dr satan's echo chamber um has really like rippled throughout a lot of the work that i've done and in my thinking and just one of those pieces that's really sat with me for a long time a lot of the words and uh choices of words and stuff um so i appreciate that thank you for um you know that work um, and yeah, I think the, the growth into this uh, project of the anarchic AIs, I can see an amazing journey, you know, into the depths of that relationship that you started speaking about between uh, humans and machine and uh, where it can go. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, a lot of um, my own work is in sort of these spaces that uh, Ralph was speaking about now of um, I guess, underground electronic dance music um, within Africa and the diaspora. Um, And it's often referred to as like a, a, I guess a genre would they call like global bass or tropical bass. There's a lot of different names for the sort of styles of music that are coming out of the global South and, um, you know, uh, from the African diaspora. Um, And some of these genres such as like gom uh, music, which, uh, you know, Ralph is also speaking about from, made out of pirate software in the townships mm-hmm. of Durban um, to like by Lefunk music from the favelas mm-hmm. in Brazil or Kuduro in uh, Lisbon via Angola. Um, uh, you know, it sort of makes me think a lot about that your text in Dr. Satan's echo chamber, you, you um, reference Lee Scratch Perry, the late Lee Scratch Perry RIP um, and sort of the birth of the electronic dance music within the Jamaican sound systems. And in it, you speak about this echo from the Big Bang, you know, that carries out um, in, in human history, um, as well as like these kind of occult um, sort of things within the machine, I guess, like the ESX machina um, type of thing. And, um, you know, in some of these sounds that I've, that I've been coming across, there's this, um, a lot of the drums that are being sampled have sometimes spiritual uh, like trans inducing purpose initially and also were used for say preparing for war and things like that and are now on dance floors and sort of taking over um the internet and stuff and um i'm interested in how you view these sort of new sounds such as gom 
music or kuduro and um, how you see the future of these sounds which seem to be sort of taking over the internet through their own sort of anarchic economic and material systems um, using obviously pirate software and yeah. WhatsApp. And do you feel that that is sort of an extension of this echo that you spoke about um, that was happening in Jamaica in the early 80s? And sort of where do you see these kinds of musical subcultures going in the future? Um, yeah, what are the possibilities of that that you can see for, yeah. Thank <laughs> like, you. No, no, thank you so uh, much. If you remember <laughs> Dr. Satan, you know, yes. right now we think of that essay and I'm very pleased that that essay, I'm flattered and shocked at how far it's gone. In fact, one day I should write a story about discovering how that essay has been distributed all over the world without me knowing anything about it. It's an interesting story. <laughs> but if you're interested in the history of um, Black uses of technology in the diaspora, you can't worry too much about copyright. <laughs> Things get spread, and that's important. It happened with the essay and the work, and it's happened with the sounds. But if you listen to Dr. If you read Dr. Satan's again, you'll realize that I mentioned drum and bass and other kinds of music that in the early 90s were quite new. When I wrote that essay, those were brand new musics. And when I went to Jamaica to deliver it initially, folks in Jamaica had never heard of any of those musics, right? And so the essay attempts to argue that Jamaican sound system culture, through its fetishizing of technology, right, began to chart a new possibility for Blacks in technology in sound. As an example, I cited drum and bass, and I also mentioned Detroit techno, which is, of course, an earlier period. But for Jamaicans, they didn't realize that dub had been involved in this broader conversation via echoes. I bring this up, um, Chris, because it's happening again. All of the subgenres that you've mentioned, they're all happening again. But to answer your question, I don't want to really get too specific about the new genres. All of those genres for me are an epiphenomenon. They are symptomatic of something much larger that I'm trying to talk about. And I've been trying to talk about since uh, Dr. Satan's echo chamber, which is why my work doesn't explicitly talk about music anymore. Not because I'm not interested in the music, but I've always been arguing that music is just the way that young black people all over the world engage technology first. Dr. Satan's echo chamber and another couple of essays I wrote about, for example, the Nigerian internet scams or the Ghanaian internet scams and that whole culture of, you know, I've never been to South Africa, but I suspect that you have areas that are just full of computer waste and full of machines that young people grow up in. I was arguing that what was happening with music was just the advanced presence of a broader black diaspora engagement with technology and machines, right? So as we see with Kuduro and Gom and all of these kinds of music, they're just soundtracks to a broader black information revolution globally. It's hard to see this revolution if we only call it musical. For me, the music now, as it was during dub and sound system culture, all of that is a sign of a broader investment in technology and patching together bits and pieces, whether you're downloading this, whether it's FL Studio or whether it's, you know, whatever, right? It's an engagement with machines. I don't know where it's going to go, but it is a sign of constant growth and direction, right? I tend to be very cautious about identifying where things are going to end up because most people who do that are like painfully wrong. <laughs> it's hard to predict, right? But what I do see going on is that the music is a sign of an ongoing and widening engagement with technology and machines, which is why I'm now talking about artificial intelligence and different kinds of technological formats to hopefully chart a narrative for all people, but particularly Black people in the diaspora, to see that the moment you pick up a turntable, you know, you're, be, you're participating in something that is in conversation with AI and all kinds of technologies. So Chris, I hope that gives you some answer. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Lee. Um, Chris, Chris is back. Yes, wow, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, this is really like, yeah, opening my mind up in lots of different ways. I mean, the sort of like power um, right now of seeing, I guess, um, you know, people um, from Africa and the diaspora sort of 
using AI in a way is such a revolutionary concept, you know, like in, because a lot of, I guess, the new frontier of, of ways that people will also, um, I guess, have like class struggle and things like that will also be within AI. And we kind of see it as a sort of cloud thing, this um, untang intangible thing that we can't, uh, you know, that's just hovering above us, but it's exactly. a very physical thing that's like people are mining these, um, the elements for our phones in the DRC, you know. Um, exactly, that's very much Africa a part of very present in that whole, um, you know, system again. And it's cool to see that um, there could be a potential for this a shift in those power kind of dynamics, you know, just like in the music, how, you know, through the underground, these things came up like, it would be so cool to see that happening with AI and technology, I guess. Well, yeah. I, I, there's an essay I wrote that I'm, <laughs> that uh, it's called Invisible Missive Magnetic Juju. It's about Nigerian cybercrime. And one of the things that I focus on in the essay, I parallel the rise of Nigerian, you know, the Yahoo boys and the 419s back in the 80s and 90s. I parallel the rise of that with Jamaica in the 1970s and the rise of dub production and reggae production and the coming of di digital dance hall, right? And one of the ways I parallel is by asking this question, how is it that Nigeria in the 80s and 90s became the leading culture of online financial crime and fraud when in fact, none of these people owned their own computers? How is it possible that from Internet cafes spread all along the streets in Lagos. Young, largely men, were not only putting th computers together, right, but using them to siphon off millions and billions of dollars from the West, right? Without getting into the moral and ethical questions of that kind of fraud, how the hell is that possible in a country where people are living on less than a dollar a day at the time, right? Um, that's unpredictable. You couldn't have predicted that, but it's really about a, a part of this ongoing engagement with technology, right? Happening in the black diaspora. And it happens in unpredictable ways. That's why I'm very hesitant to tell you where things are gonna go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. And thank you, Chris, so much for joining us as well. Um, Sane, I'm going to, going to go to you, my colleague Sane from Huma. Um, thank you, Ralph. And thank you to our speaker. Uh, my question is around, um, I'm just wondering how to accommodate different languages or different uh, accent in AI systems. <laughs> so for instance, when uh, one is looking at um, systems like Siri or Alexa, I noticed that you have to sound like a certain way for mm. this, to get these machines to help you with whatever you're asking them to do. So I'm just wondering, how do we uh, challenge algorithm bias and prejudice, given that uh, the creators or the developers of uh, the systems, they, the algorithms tend to stem from like prejudice. So I'm just wondering, how do we accommodate other accents and languages and challenge uh, prejudice? Thank you. A oh, wonderful question. Um, your question would apply equally to questions of facial, facial recognition and other sorts of things, right? Um, a really simplistic but super complicated response to that would be, in the spirit of what I'm talking about with music and sound and technology, the way to fix that is us doing it. <laughs> or more of us doing it and more of us feeling that we can do it, that it's a space that is amenable to our engagement, right? Um, I think a lot of, when I talk to a lot of younger people about AI, or not, regardless of whether they're black, brown, male, female, straight, whatever, AI is seen as elite, powerful, corporate, right? And so there's a sort of distance, but I know there are more and more African men and women trying to get involved in the conversations of AI, but it's important to have people realize that AI is as corporate and as white and as belonging to them as drum machines were in the 70s, right? Or software programs in the 80s and 90s. They may seem alien, they may seem strange, and they all even sound, we can get into another conversation about the biases in sound production software. That's a complicated but important issue. But people engage them. 
and started to transform them and transform them in ways that then fed back into the system where now the producers of that material have changed the software or even sometimes analog hardware changed to adapt to different aesthetic and political um, priorities. I believe that that is possible with AI, but even if it's not possible, we have to think it is possible and do it anyway. Right? Because in order for this thing to change, you know, your question is just so crucial. In order for this to change, we just have to do it. <laughs> you know, we have to get involved and feel like we can do it. And one of the ways to do so, I think, is to begin with this narrative that starts with music, studios, and technology as intimate to blackness, however we conceptualize blackness throughout the black diaspora. And then what do next generations and generations after, what do they do when they come up thinking that AI is no different than logic or Pro Tools? Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Sunny. Um, I'm thinking back to when you mentioned William Gibson and Neuromancer um, earlier on, and thinking of that idea of the hacker that was, you know, pop popularized partly in that kind of cyber, 90s yes. cyber culture. Um, but still is very relevant because when we are talking about this use of pirated software to produce new kinds of music that were never imagined, you know, by the software creators, there's also this sense of, of hacking, this engagement with um, using technology in ways that it might not have been intended to use. Absolutely. Um, and I'd like to think there about technology in terms of being open or closed, because some technologies are more open and some are more closed. Um, and so that technologies have affordances you know like they allow they allow for certain things even if they weren't intentionally designed that way they still have affordances they can be used in other ways so if just yesterday i was talking to a university of zimbabwe informatics uh, lecturer who's also a medical doctor at the hospital um, and we were talking about ai and accessibility of ai and he was saying well you know it is it is you know the big ai systems are under corporate control and they're you know managed by the large corporations but we should be uh, looking at open source AI, for example. Yes, exactly. Yep. So, so there's that there's that strand within technological development as well, which that you reminded me of is that like how do we identify and promote technologies that are open to manipulation um, and less uh, less closed and resistant to manipulation. Well, I mean, look at the history of technology, and I don't mean in terms of corporate capitalism but the size and scale of those kinds of um, systems of power, but uh, technologies remain closed for, for periods of time and then stuff happens, <laughs> right? Things that, things that may be created as closed or exclusive, they get pirated, they get bootlegged, they get transformed in multiple ways. And, Sometimes it takes a bit of time, but I look at the history of technology from the perspective of, I don't use the word hacker as much only because I don't come out of computer programming culture, but I look at pirating and downloading and bootlegging and manipulating as yeah. an inevitable part of technological change, absolutely. And so yeah. I, there's no reason to assume that's going to stop happening. Yeah, no, I think piracy is crucial. I mean, you mentioned it earlier in terms of your own work and you know, being happy that your work has, has spread and rec recognizing how uh, IP has to be you know, fle flexible or there are other gains to be had you know, around uh, breaking IP. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, the, there's, there's one book I remember called Pirate Culture, which is outlining how piracy has pushed forward technology historically yes. at each major juncture. Um, and it's... It's, it's interesting because people have taken huge risks and some people have been imprisoned, uh, like Napster, for example. We, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have iTunes or Spotify if we didn't have Napster. Absolutely. And Napster you know, was illegal. And as far as I know, you remember the, I remember the, uh, the, leader, the leader of Napster was jailed. You know, he was, uh, you know, um, but we, we all now benefit from his breaking of the rules. Yes, so indeed. yeah, it's important for us to recognize, especially in Africa, the importance of, of piracy and rule breaking uh, okay. when it comes to IP. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, not, not we, just trying to form our own IP, but questioning IP. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is a, this is dangerous because we also know that a lot of people lose money and their work gets exploited, etc. particularly in the black world. But at the same time, would Jamaica have done what it did if it had serious copyright laws in the 60s and 70s? <laughs> yeah. Well, 
all hip hop in the in the eighties. Oh, absolutely in the eighties, absolutely. Yeah. Right? And again, yeah. I know people lost a lot of money, and I and I'm sympathetic. But at the same time, you know, piracy did some things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a comment in the chat here. Um, um, oh, it's it's my colleague uh, Minekler uh, commenting on the challenges of having an open data ecosystem say in Zimbabwe. Um, yeah, so I guess it's about the infrastructure in infrastructure for AI. Yeah, um, yeah. Does uh, does anybody else have a, a question or uh, or comment for um, for Louis? Also, I, I don't actually want to start this separate conversation, but yeah. I just want to say that I'm also still on the fence as to whether or not AI is going to even develop the way we all assume it is, <laughs> or yeah. that corporations or governments are going to be able to control it the way they think they are, right? Mm -hmm. But also so much, as I say, in the, when I said a little while ago, I said that, you know, we always have to worry that sometimes our reading of science fiction colors our understanding of technological reality. Um, this is as much the case for me and you, Ralph, as it is for Elon Musk and some of these folks who have, in my opinion, some fairly deluded ideas about what these technologies can do. Yeah. <laughs> so we're yeah. all that is we're still on the fence about what's going to yeah. happen in terms of even general AI. I don't know that I believe that's even possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's I mean there's a there's a healthy skepticism about AI. We. One of the texts we've read in our in our institution is the Atlas of AI, Kate, Kate Crawford. Yes, I know the I know the work. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. I mean, Chris earlier mentioned the the material base of AI. It reminded me of that. But yeah, whether 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 AI is a thing, um, and I think in your short short text for an artificial intelligence, you also you know draw attention to that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the importance of narrative when you're talking about sci-fi, the, the importance of storytelling and how it directs, you know, for example, you mentioned Elon Musk, that he's doing what he does in part because he's so influenced by the sci-fi he was exposed to. <laughs> um, yes. And that's why it's important that we have Southern sci-fi and Afrofuturist uh, sci-fi and Chicana sci-fi so that it and represents Southern perspectives. Well, it also is a rejection of the future as articulated by dominant systems. Hmm. Right, right. That's what's yeah. so healthy about these alternative futures that are quite fashionable. It's just people realizing that, oh, the future is unwritten. Yes. <laughs> and the future that we're yeah. supposed to believe is inevitable is actually a part of a kind of cultural programming that we have to break. Yes, absolutely. I mean, our, one of our, our guests a few weeks ago was the scholar Ziauddin uh, Sadar. Um, and he writes about uh, decolonizing the future. And he has this ah, provocative phrase great. from a, a text in the early 2000s where he says, the future is already colonized. Our task is to decolonize the future, to bring it, to take it back, you know. I'd love that link. If you have, if you remember to send it to me, I'd love that. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly send it to you, yeah. Um, so Jessica, Jessica Edwards um, has, has sent a message that's, uh, that's to me. Uh, but for you. Um, so she says, thank you for yet another inspiring and provocative talk. And as less of a question and more of an exhortation to further expand, I wonder if you could say more to your renunciation of AI and machine learning as merely imitative or mimetic and more inclined towards the unearthing of the emergent potential of interstitial spaces. Wow, that is, that is a lot. Well, let, first off, let me say, hello, Jessica. I know Jessica, I haven't okay. seen or heard from Jessica in some time. Thank you for being here. Um, well, that was precisely the project as we, or as I insisted that the programmers think about Caribbean theory, right? As I insisted that the programmers who were more familiar with science fiction read Edward Kamar Brathwaite, read dialect. And so the algorithm really explores sounds in between dialects and in between forms of language, right? Because in terms of how AI is, let me back off from saying AI more broadly. In terms of how we program, we, well, it tends to focus on an attempt at perfection, an, att an attempt at you know, clarity, which is mimetic. <laughs> right? For it to be clear is for it to be similar enough to what we know for us to recognize as clear. Right, And so if you listen to the album, a lot of it is forcing us to understand and appreciate 
non-mimetic mimetic sounds, the growls and the grunts that become rhythmic over time, right? Which is kind of how we hear the other when we don't understand the other's language, right? So what you're describing there, Jessica, is exactly what the project is attempting to do, right? As to what others can do with this concept, I look forward to seeing it. But it is about the interstitial. It is about the fragments and the bits and pieces. It is about diaspora, not centers. It is about dialects, not language. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. And we're now in the last few minutes, so I'm going to I'm going to start uh, start wrapping up um, and say thank you, thank you, Louis, and a, and a special a special thank you for doing this on Thanksgiving, a holiday in the U.S. Um, and I know that was you know due to your very busy teaching schedule and mm -hmm. and your work, and that that was very gracious of you to to fit in the seminar on your on your day off. So I hope you really enjoy the rest of Thanksgiving. Um, so thanks very much for being here with us. Thank you. And those of you who have other questions, feel free to send me an email. And after I recover from Thanksgiving, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to respond. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Lee. So uh, thanks to all, the, all uh, the participants in this seminar. Uh, you've been listening to an entire seminar series uh, hosted by HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. We're a Pan-African Research Institute. Uh, one of our research strand is into artificial intelligence and healthcare in Africa. Um, and I can see a lot of comments in the chat of uh, appreciation uh, for your, for your uh, talk and for your engagement with us here, Louis. So thank, thank you very much. Oh, and, to, and uh, thank you. And uh, Devai, my, my director has asked me to point out that tomorrow is the launch of our policy series. Thank you. <laughs>